Hello, I'm Graham Fitch coming to you from Steinway Hall in London for Pianist Magazine and this presentation is all about time signatures. Some people get a little confused with the difference between simple time, compound time, complex time. What's it all about? Uh, well, I hope to just go through that a little bit and, and demystify some of those hmm, queries that you might have. So time signatures are uh, problematic in some ways because some of the rules that were laid down for tempo, how we find the tempo, let's say in the Baroque period, rules that we tend to have forgotten, I'm going to get into that now, but a time signature is basically two numbers stacked one on top of the other, so two, four. The upper number tells us how many uh, beats we've got in the, each bar, each measure, and the lower figure tells us the, what sort of beats they are. In other words, a four would be a quarter note. So two quarter notes in a bar would be two four. Three eight would tell us three eighth notes or three quavers if you come from that system. Uh, four two would be four minims or four half notes. So simple so far. Uh, okay, now simple time is where the beat is divided in twos. One and two and three and is known as simple triple, for example. Compound time is where the beat is divided up into divisions of three. One and a two and a three and a. Do you get the difference between the two? One and two and three and is simple triple. One and a two and a three and a is compound triple, where the main beat is a dotted note. Okay, so how to tell from the time signature whether you've got a compound time or a simple time is again simple what you do if the upper no upper number sorry is a multiple of three apart from three itself not the number three itself but six nine twelve then you know it's compound time okay i'm going to go into this a little bit further but the other thing to say is the, if you've got, say, a, a, a small number at the, as the lower number, 3, 2, as opposed to 3, 8, or 3, 4, 3, 8, it tells us that the, the, the music is heavier and slower. So a 3, 2 is going to be heavier and slower and weightier than a 3, 4, and a 3, 8 is going to be nice and light. Um, 3, 16 would be even lighter and even faster. So that's really the difference. Um, but composers will often, especially in the 19th century onwards, or the 18th century, give us other words to tell us you know, the mood and the, the speed. But we've got to go back a little bit before I play anything. I'm just going to spend two seconds further uh, talking about tempo ordinario, sometimes known as tempo giusto, which is something that in the Baroque period, often people say, I don't know how fast to play my uh, allemande or my prelude and fugue. It would be based on the human heartbeat somewhere between 60 and 80. So if I would take a very famous piece of Bach. Uh, that would be the tempo ordinario for that piece, somewhere between 60 and 80 for the crotchet, for the quarter note. Now I was taught as a student how to find 60 on a metronome without actually using a metronome. One higgledy-piggledy, two higgledy-piggledy, three. That gives you 60, more or less. I'm not saying that's exactly 60, but... That would be the tempo that Bach would have envisaged. Uh, so when we hear this speed, uh, that's not really kind of Baroque. It's not to say that it can't work, it's just, to me, not quite right. So, uh, Kienberger, who was one of Bach's students in 1770, looking at the date here, 1776, formulated all of this. So we know that Presto is faster than Allegro, which is faster than Moderato, and we have approximate uh, metronome type indications for those. But of course, from the middle of the 18th century, the, this notion lost, it, lost a little bit of its traction and you know, it gave way to very personal ideas about speed in the 19th century, which we still hear today. Bach players who can play the same piece really slowly and have it sound wonderful, 
and another Bach player coming along and playing it really fast and having it sound wonderful. So, you know, you've got to remember that the metronome wasn't invented until 1815. Let's look at a few of these time signatures. Simple duple, 2-4. So strong, weak, strong, weak. One, two, one, two, one, two. And so on, the Italian concerto of Bach, first movement. Strong, weak. Is it as simple as that, though? No. When we get to, let me just make sure I've got the right bar number, bar three, we've got a juicy syncopation. So one and two. And because of that syncopation, the accent tends to get thrown to the long note, to the syncopation itself. So it's not, but. So this is where the syncopation, as it were, trumps the hierarchy of one, two, strong, weak. Think about, so think about so the strong, weak is the grid, and this is the thing that opposes that grid. Okay, so it, it makes an exception of the strong, weak, strong, weak rule. And this is what music does all the time. We see it here. So the second beat, I'm, I'm over a little bit at the next phrase, left hand, syncopation. So the second beat in that instance would get a little bit more than the first beat. Now, Compound duple, one and a, two and a. We don't count six, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six. One and a, two and a. One and a, two and a. Schumann Romance. Now look what starts to happen here. The syncopation, which gets even more insistent until by here, Schumann has turned it into a hemiola. Now just quickly explain what a hemiola is. It's not something you see the doctor about. It's where the music that has been going one and a, uh, two and a, uh, becomes one and two and three and. It's a little rhythmic trick. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Bernstein's West Side Story, America, does exactly that. So Schumann is, is playing that rhythmical trick on this. There it's a little ambiguous, possibly, depending if you want to make it so. Here. Can you hear the three beats now? Now a piece of Brahms. This is a good example of compound duple in a 6-4 time signature. And if you remember what I was saying earlier, the the smaller the number underneath, the slower and the weightier the feel of the piece. So it's, it's still two in a bar. Another romance. And two. Sorry, I got a little lost there. Could you hear the hemiola in that bar where I got to bar four? It's no longer in two, it's in three. One, two, one, two, one, two. So there's another example of how composers work against the hierarchy of the, the beats. So four, four, simple quadruple. Um, one, two, three, four. So it's strong, weak, less strong on the third beat, and then weakest on the fourth beat. That's if nothing much was going on on the surface of the music. So let me see with this Haydn sonata, the, the B minor Haydn uh, Hoboken 32. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That works quite well.
well so far. However, when we get to this phrase, the weight is surely not on the first beat. I don't think anybody would do this. But, uh, to hear the third beat. So again, we cannot be uh, dogmatic about this strong, weak, strong, weak business because composers go against the grid all too often in the music. So here's an example of 12-8, which is compound quadruple. So if you remember, what we had before was one and two and three and four and. Now we've got one and a two and a three and a four and. A. first beat that I just wound up on is actually lighter than the third beat of the beginning of the phrase to make a natural phrase. So the composer, this is the Mendelssohn Song Without Words, opus 53, uh, number one. Very beautiful piece. So the, the fact that there's a long phrase mark written by Mendelssohn and a diminuendo crosses the grid. So we would not be dogmatic about that strong, weak, slightly less strong, weakest uh, dogma that um, we, we're told when we learn music theory. It doesn't apply to real music. Now, it, it, just an example of something that's also compound quadruple, but is written in 1216, interesting, time signature. I'm not sure if you've seen too many of these. This is the Bach G major French suite Gigue, uh, the final movement. 1216 tells me to play lighter and faster than if it were written in idea there. So if it were written in 6-8, let's say in eighth notes in quavers rather than in semi-quavers or sixteenth notes, it may be something along those lines, but we want to just lighten it up a little bit. And we know that because of the time signature. 3-8, simple triple, introduction that piece does it the Furilisa of Beethoven flowing gently in semiquavers 16th notes thin texture lighter lighter than it would be if it were in 3-4 for example now the famous Moonlight Sonata first movement um, I was listening to somebody uh, play this the other day I was giving a lesson to somebody who was playing this for me again it's such a well-known piece that I don't need to give you a taste of it yet I will in a second and it was very slow, and I asked him at the end, what's the time signature? I didn't let him look at his score. And he said, uh, it's in four. I said, no, it's not, it's in two. It's a time signature known as a la breva, or two, two. And it's the cut, the C for the common time, with a line through it. And that tells us to play in two in a bar, not in four. So it should sound like this sort of um, feel. One, two. One, two. So this is adagio, but in two time. One, two, one. So a little bit more movement. You hear a lot of times people playing it like this. That's quite wrong. 
because we're ignoring Beethoven's instruction that it's in two in a bar, not in four. And just one, uh, maybe there's a couple more examples here, uh, of, of two two or a la breve, the gavotte from the French suite that, that I played a little of earlier, I played the gigue from, again, lighter. articulation and my tempo and my dynamic is all of these are dictated by the time signature if it were in four time I might choose to play it like that but because it's in two and my articulation you notice I do that quite lightly so that the time signature tells me to do that or indicates that. Um, just one last example of, this is a complex time signature, a Bartok, the Bulgarian dance number two, or the, the from the six dances in Bulgarian rhythm, has a really weird looking time signature. It's two plus two plus three over eight. So one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two three, short, short, long, short, but unequal beats. struggle to feel that rhythm, you could practice a scale in that rhythm. Do you get the idea? You can use scales to help you with that. What a great way to practice a scale. I hope that's given you a few ideas, a little bit of clarity on this complex issue of Time Signatures, thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you again soon.